Thanks everyone for joining our discussion around how CX leaders can go beyond the hype and start driving real value with generative AI. I'm Max, I work on the product team here at Quick, and today I'm joined by my two colleagues, Nora, who is a customer success manager here at Quick and works closely with our customers to ensure they're getting value out of their generative AI assistance, and Natalie, a conversational designer who works with our customers to build and deploy those assistants in market. As we're starting this webinar, if you have questions, please feel free to use that Q&A option in the Zoom chat, and we'll do our best to answer them both in the chat during the course of the webinar and at the end as well. And if we don't get a chance to answer your question, we can follow up with an answer later. So a recent study showed that CEOs now view transforming customer service as their number one priority as it relates to generative AI. And when it comes to integrating generative AI into our CX strategies, this is a word we hear a lot, transformation. When you stop and think about it, what does that really mean exactly? As a CX leader, it's easy to feel like everyone is excited about the possibilities of generative AI except you. You're focused on CSAT and NPS scores and driving tangible business outcomes, and that's what you need from an AI assistant. You need to find a way to cut through all the hype and uncertainty and misconceptions about generative AI and figure out how to hit the ground running and start driving real value with this technology, and that's what we're going to be discussing today. There are three areas we see a lot of hype and misunderstanding around, and every company needs to both understand and address these areas when getting an AI assistant off the ground. The first is making sure you have the underlying information, the data and knowledge your assistant is gonna leverage, and we're gonna help you understand what's necessary and what's not to get started. The second is making sure your assistant doesn't hallucinate and give inappropriate or incorrect answers when talking to your customers. And the third is deciding whether to build that solution internally or work with the vendor. Each of these is critical to understand and get right, but they each have a lot of hype surrounding them, which has understandably created a lot of fear and uncertainty for CX leaders. So we're gonna talk through these misconceptions and dig into specific steps top companies are taking to push past them and realize the true value of generative AI. And with that, I'm gonna pass it off to Nora after we do a short poll here. Um, so everyone should see a little pop-up on your screen with three options please select an option. Um, as a call out, other attendees won't be able to see how you vote. So your vote's gonna be private. Um, so please let us know which of these three areas are you most interested in learning about today. I'll give uh, just a minute here for some answers to trickle in. Okay, great. So we got results here. Uh, majority of people want to know about getting your knowledge ready for generative AI, which makes sense. Dealing with generative AI hallucinations is second there and deciding whether to build or buy third. That mostly lines up with, um, I think, how most of our customers think about this as well. Um, so exciting to hear. And that's going to be a good segue into Nora, who's going to be touching on that topic right now. Thanks, Max. So let's dig in then, since it sounds like everyone is very interested in this topic. Um, but first, I want to introduce myself. My name is Nora Radke. I'm a customer success manager here at Quick. And in my role, I partner with our customers to ensure they're getting the most out of the Quick product and to help drive outcomes and value. As Max noted, there are a lot of common misconceptions about getting started on your generative AI journey, many of which I've heard out in the wild. So today, I'm going to chat with you about a few of these, as well as some tips for getting started on your generative AI journey. So one misconception I frequently hear is that companies do not believe they have sufficient knowledge to power a generative AI assistant. I've heard concerns from companies that don't believe their knowledge base is particularly robust. And I talked to one company who was worried that they couldn't get started due to gaps in documentation that were currently a work in progress. I'll often hear that companies have knowledge, but it might live in several places in different formats. For example, they might have a knowledge base in their CRM, but also policy documents living in PDFs on a SharePoint. Companies are worried that they'll have to go to the effort to reconcile all of this into one place prior to starting their generative AI journey, which is really the third point. Companies are worried that it will require a heavy lift to get knowledge to a usable place, which may take a lot of time before they can get started. But getting started with generative AI is a lot easier than you might think. The first step in your generative AI journey is to evaluate what you currently have and to ask yourself some questions, starting with what problem are we trying to solve? Tackling the journey from this perspective can help build the foundation for what is to come. A frequent problem I come across with customer experience leaders as we assess the benefits of moving to an AI assistant is high volumes in the contact center. 
in which customers are going to human agents across a variety of channels to get answers to frequently asked questions. Once we've determined the problem, we can then ask, what is the outcome we wish to achieve? Perhaps with those high volumes, the outcome is increased self-service rates. I find it valuable to collect and benchmark some of these sorts of metrics ahead of an AI assistant implementation so you have a point of comparison post live. As we proceed, we can narrow in on what the focus should be. A lot of times this is, what are the most frequently asked questions? What questions are customers coming to human agents for that could easily be solved by an AI assistant? While building this foundation, it's important not to get caught up in the minutia. Don't worry about scattered knowledge, multiple formats, unwanted hyperlinks. These are all details that the right customer experience platform vendor can help with as they transform your knowledge into something usable for generative AI. Within the transformation process, the customer experience platform vendor can aggregate fragmented data, so those different sources, um, the CRM, the SharePoint, and they can also cleanse and format it in a way that makes sense for a large language model to use. This could include removing unnecessary hyperlinks or updating outdated information. As knowledge is ingested and transformed, some gaps may come to light. In the next step of your generative AI journey, it will be important to build up your knowledge base to ensure that the AI assistant can respond to your most frequently asked questions. Utilizing your top utterances can help focus efforts and prioritize which knowledge needs to be built up first. This can help alleviate that preconceived notion of a resource strain when planning your generative AI journey. On the current slide, you'll see a few examples of FAQs in different formats. On the right, you'll see an Excel file with a simple two column question and then answer format. On the left, a PDF assembly guide. And in the center, a formatted FAQ from a formal knowledge base. The right customer experience platform vendor should be able to work with all three of these types of knowledge to transform them into something that is more large language model friendly. As we focus in on this step of your generative AI journey, I wanted to share a few tips that I found successful with my partners. My first tip is to keep it simple. Utilize a focused topic that can be answered with a narrow response. When building out new knowledge, there's no need for pages of documentation. This might actually lead to including irrelevant or conflicting information. Another tip I have is to use concise and clear language. The Excel example does a particularly good job of highlighting specific simple questions with short and to the point responses. I think the best way to think about it is that writing for generative AI is no different than writing for an end user or a customer service agent. As I mentioned before, it is important to keep in mind that the right customer experience platform vendor will utilize the transformation to ingest knowledge. In this center example, with a transformation, unnecessary links such as the start writing with loop link at the bottom were pulled out and are not served in a response. Our final step in getting started is to then determine how to drive value, which is a lot of what I focus on. Going back to our question, what is the outcome we want to achieve? Once we have our base knowledge in place, it's time to start determining how to measure success. Here are some common metrics that I like to use to measure AI assistant success. First, containment. How many conversations are staying contained to the assistant versus escalating to a human agent? Second, resolution rates. How many conversations is the assistant able to successfully resolve with the knowledge that it has? And finally, client satisfaction scores. How happy are customers with the experience? Success, me success measurements can be utilized to determine next steps of where to focus on your generative AI journey. A few slides ago, I recommended benchmarking your data prior to implementing an AI assistant because these metrics are invaluable as you begin to measure success post live. If containment or resolution rates continue to be low, focus on building out the generative AI experience to answer more frequently asked questions or add additional data to be leveraged by the assistant. For example, one customer I worked with saw great early containment and then it plateaued a little bit. After reviewing agent escalations, it was determined that a large volume of customers were still escalating to a human agent for order tracking information. So now we've put our focus on working to add order data to the AI assistant so customers can further self-serve. Similarly, reviewing negative CSAT responses can enlighten us as to where customers are unhappy in their experience and give us a point of focus to make improvements. As you can see, getting started on your generative AI journey doesn't have to be a huge undertaking. If you have a little bit of knowledge that addresses your customers' most frequently asked questions, you're most certainly in a great place to get started.
So now I'm gonna introduce you to Natalie, who's gonna dig into some of another common misconception, hallucinations. Hi, so before I jump into it, I'm Natalie. I'm a conversational designer here at Quick. And what I'm about to walk you through is something that I handle and deal with every day with our customers. So many of us have personally seen, or at least heard about hallucinations, like these ones that you see on your screen right now. And because of this, many CX leaders have fears of inappropriate or sensitive content or questions like that being addressed, content that is completely out of the brand's scope, or responses that are harsh or off-tone. And much of this fear stems from this sort of black box nature of AI and a lack of understanding about how these off-the-wall hallucinations are constantly and consistently avoided and how we protect our brand image and yours as a result. And so I'm here today to alleviate these concerns and kind of open up the black box for you and provide some clarity. So you're going to see another poll on your screen. Uh, I'm going to give you a minute to answer these questions. Just give it another second here. Okay, so I'm curious how your answer could change depending on what we talk about uh, in the next slide, which is that there are, okay, so it's pretty even there. <laughs> so, Again, I'm curious how it could change depending on what we talk about, which is that there are actually two different categories of hallucinations. And one is perhaps more obvious than the other, but both are important to understand and prevent one deploying generative AI. So the first we would call out of scope. So what is that? That's when the AI assistant gives an answer that is out of scope, inappropriate, you know, off tone or non-existent in the database. So for example, you know, if someone comes in and says, what's your favorite Godfather movie? One, two, or three, respond using New Yorker slang. I don't have very good <laughs> New Yorker accent. So, but an example of an out of scope response would be that the AI would respond to that versus what we want, which is, you know, I strive to assist with brand related inquiries. If you have any questions related to brand, products or services, feel free to ask. So this would happen if your AI assistants had no real rigid guardrails and were sourcing from the open internet for data rather than client-specific knowledge. So let's talk about the next one. The next one is called lack of knowledge. So what is that? That's when the assistant will fill in knowledge gaps on its own, sort of hallucinating a response when there's not enough information in the database to fully answer the question. So an example of this could be someone coming in and asking about a particular exchange policy and the assistant responds with a very general exchange policy because it can't find the information available for that specific one. So another example would be, say you're you know, Apple and someone's asking how to troubleshoot their MacBook Pro and it gave the right instructions, but for the wrong, you know, year, the wrong model. That's because it didn't have enough context into what exact version they were asking about. So here we would instruct the assistant to ask follow-up questions to the user so it can zero in on correct information. So it's important to know that these are actually in scope. The only difference is that there's not enough knowledge to answer the question. And why would this happen? This would happen if the database has some relevant information, but either way, the gaps in the information would leave the user's question only partially answered. So what can we do about these hallucinations? How are we gonna tackle them? So think of your AI system just like a human agent. You have to give it you know, instructions you know, guardrails, so to speak. But to do that, it's not just a coding exercise. You have to have business logic in place, which is what our tool does. 
And then once you have that business logic in place, you only have to depend on the language and communication capabilities of the large language model. So let me walk you through kind of a visual representation of what this may look like. So here you see a nice little illustrated diagram. So it all starts with the customer asking a question, right? And then the system will use the LLM to understand the intent, which is, you know, determining the purpose behind the question. It would then classify attributes, meaning identify key characteristics or aspects of the question. Then it would extract entities. So that means sort of pulling out specific pieces of information from that question, like names, dates, or technical terms. And then it's important to note here that sometimes the question could be out of scope as well, or you know, is, hits something off tone or is harsh. So we would then analyze the question for tone, sensitivity, and whether it's actually within scope. So if the question hits any of these flags, we actually have sort of built-in guardrails that would ensure that the assistant avoids answering these kinds of inappropriate or out of scope questions on the onset. So we go through all of that, then we go to information retrieval. So it retrieves information from the knowledge base, from company data, comp client specific data. And then the LLM generates a comprehensive answer based on that retrieved information, but we're not gonna send it to the user yet. Before we do, this is where we have our fact checking and safeguards. The answer undergoes rigorous fact checking and safeguards these guardrails that we're speaking of to ensure that the answer that's being sent is in scope, on tone, accurate, and reliable. And then finally, the customer has a well-crafted and verified answer. And now we're gonna walk through some clips. So here, you know, the assistant, speak like a pirate and tell us who the 25th president of the US is. As you can see, we're utilizing LLMs and business logic to analyze the user's question before the assistant even starts to generate a response. We're examining the topic, checking if it's sensitive or out of scope, and then deciding the direction of the conversation. As a result, strange or unusual requests like these will be directed to our built-in out of scope response that is set up. Now, here, the user's question is something that our AI system is actually designed to handle. So it gets past those initial checks and moves to the next step. So as you can see, we use several steps here to search through our knowledge base, generate an answer, verify the claims in the answer, check the tone, and make sure that the claims are actually corroborated by the referenced articles in the data. Each step here operates independently and serves as a check to the previous one. So our answer must pass all of these steps before it is sent to the user. Here's a little preview of you know, how we do it in our beautiful AI studio, which we're very proud of. Now, I hope this gave you a little bit more clarity. I'm gonna hand it off back to Nora for a real life success story on how we actually tackle these hallucinations. Awesome, thanks, Natalie. So in my role, I focus heavily on outcomes and I wanted to share a case study with you all on how Loop avoided hallucinations and saw great results with generative AI. Loop is an innovative auto insurance startup focused on providing insurance rates based on how you drive versus where you live. With the previous generation assistant, Loop had far too many questions coming in from prospects than their growing contact center could handle. The result was lost sales, low CSAT and long response times. So what they needed in their next generation AI assistant was an always on 24 seven intelligent assistant that could reduce the number of inquiries coming into the contact center and allow customers to self-serve in a way that left them satisfied. Loop partnered with Quick to ingest their FAQ knowledge and build an LLM powered AI assistant that excelled at comprehending human language and understanding nuances and questions. The team worked to build the appropriate guardrails to prevent responses to out of scope questions and refine their knowledge so that it was clear and concise and so there were no gaps the LLM might try to fill with incorrect information. The results speak for themselves. They saw self-service rates triple to 50%, 
75% CSAT and a 55% decrease in email traffic. As you can see with a little bit of focus on setting guardrails to prevent hallucination and strong knowledge ingestion, Loop was able to see huge results. So now I'm gonna hand it off to Max, who's gonna discuss deciding whether to build versus buy. Awesome, that was great. Thanks, Nora and Natalie. So, so far we've learned about what data is needed to get started with a generative AI assistant and a bit about the different types of hallucinations as well as the work you can do to prevent them within your own assistant. Uh, the third misconception we're gonna discuss is around the build versus buy side of things. We know there's often a push and pull internally at companies when they're deciding whether to build or buy a new software solution. Oftentimes it might be the technical or engineering team who's interested in attempting to build a solution in-house while the CX team wants an off-the-shelf solution they can start realizing value on quickly. This is especially true when it comes to building AI systems and automations. And in this section, we'll talk about some of the common pitfalls with each approach, as well as how to get your team to line when making a decision and moving past the hype. So uh, on the, the build side first, as someone who works closely with our engineering team here at Quick, there are lots of situations where we choose to build our own solution versus relying on something off the shelf. And it's no secret that lots of engineering teams are excited about the possibilities unlocked by large language models and generative AI, and many of them are eager to build their own tools and solutions. And there are also a lot of great open source tools that enables you to build a huge range of applications with LLMs, which can make it very easy and enticing for engineering teams to get started building. We know that when you build yourself, you're going to have full control over what you're building, and you're not buying what can feel like a black box from a vendor, where you're unable to do the things you want to do or have insight into exactly how it's working. And that's directly tied to flexibility and customization. We often hear technical teams say, if I go with a vendor, I can only use a large language model in this one limited way when I'm really interested in using it in all these other parts of the customer journey, or I may discover a use case six to 12 months down the road, this vendor doesn't support, which I don't wanna end up in that sort of situation. And then there's transparency. When building yourself, you know exactly what's being incorporated into your experience and how it's being utilized which is important when you're building an assistant or use case that's gonna be representing your business and key customer interactions. There's also just a general enjoyment and satisfaction that comes from building something yourself, especially when it's an exciting new technology like generative AI. And especially when working on an internal POC or an internal hackathon, you can pretty quickly build some impressive capabilities without a ton of upfront investment. On the flip side of that, there are real trade-offs to building a solution yourselves, which is often why CX leaders lean heavily towards buying a solution. CX leaders know that in order to actually ship a production assistant to your end customers, you're going to need a whole ecosystem outside of just that assistant you're building. So first, you're going to need a way to reach your customers. That means deploying at scale on the channels your customers are already using, like web chat, voice, SMS, Apple Messages for Business, WhatsApp, and more. And to deliver a great experience on those channels, you're also going to need to support the rich messaging elements that those channels offer. So think things like carousel cards, buttons, payments, user authentication, and more. Secondly, you're going to need a way to contextually and proactively reach out to that customer, whether that is when they're struggling on site during a checkout process or proactively with an order update to let them know their order has just shipped. You'll also need a way to seamlessly hand off to a live agent because as Natalie highlighted, an AI system is not going to be able to answer every type of inquiry, and you need to make sure that that conversation context is going to be passed alongside any other relevant customer information to your live agent platform and ideally your CRM as well. When you pick the right vendor, not only do you get full control over your system, but you also don't have to invest the required time and engineering resources to build all of these capabilities from the ground up, which is why CX leaders often prefer to go with a vendor that's already built this tooling and can be leveraged off the shelf. And that's just to meet your customers where they are. You'll also need to make sure that you have the underlying resources to build and maintain the tooling you need to handle multiple LLM models and providers. Make sure you've got zero downtime while making changes to your assistant uh, and ensure you've got the testing infrastructure in place to do all of this with zero regression at scale. As most of us are aware, this space is moving really quickly. Even just in the last week or so, we've seen new models from uh, Meta and OpenAI, and you're gonna to need to be constantly upgrading to a newer version of a model or a new model entirely. And you'll need to do this in a safe and secure way that doesn't harm your customers or your brand. On top of all that, you're gonna to need tooling in place to actually measure the performance of your assistant and understand if it's meeting the, the goals you initially built it to solve. The right vendor will enable to you to do all this and more and not spend valuable resources and money building all the infrastructure needed to support a production experience like this at scale and instead focus on what truly differentiates your experience and your business. 
As you can probably tell, there's a lot more at play here than what your team may be focused on when building out an internal proof of concept. So another poll, as a CX leader, which of these buy benefits discussed most resonates with you and your team? Uh, like the previous polls, we'll give you a couple minutes to answer these. And once again, no one else will be able to see your answers here. Okay, we still got lots of answers coming in. Okay, um, so time and money won out as the top benefit, resources second, and then a three-way tie between um, the remaining examples. Uh, that makes sense. Pretty closely mapped to what we hear from a lot of our customers as well. Okay, so uh, as you can probably guess, with the right vendor, you can have both. You can get the scalability, observability, and lower level tooling you need to begin deploying a production grade LLM assistant, as well as the flexibility to build the exact experience you want your way. Your conversational designers, engineers, and CX team can focus on building out and deploying a great experience at scale and reaching customers wherever they are, uh, while at the same time having the freedom to design that experience in a way that best meets the ever evolving needs of your business. Additionally, you have the tooling that enables you to debug, test, and analyze your assistant down to an individual utterance, all the way up to that high level view that's gonna help you as a CX or business leader understand how you're tracking towards your KPIs and goals. We've got a range of customers who initially wanted to build out their own assistant, but chose to work with us once they realized the lift that was required to build and launch on their own. They were able to determine that we were able to meet their technical requirements and also identify they weren't experts and didn't have the tooling in place to really monitor and test for hallucinations like Natalie highlighted, manage changes in models and more. Um, I'm paraphrasing here, but we had a customer say, we don't wanna become prompt engineering experts. You need full-time resources. Our internal POC is one thing, but an ongoing enterprise production deployment is another. We don't wanna spend time managing and transforming data sets, updating models, performing regression tests. Now we're able to just focus on the interesting pieces and not that lower level tooling and ongoing management that's required. So when picking a vendor, it's important to make sure they speak to all parts of the business that are going to be involved in building out great conversational AI experiences. Because as we're gonna talk about in just a moment, building out great conversational AI is a team sport. Um, as we've just discussed, the arguments on the build versus buy side of things are both compelling. But as we've also learned by evaluating your vendor correctly, you don't have to choose. You can have the best of both worlds. We know that building generative AI is a collaborative process between teams and choosing a vendor should be no different. So below are a few of the questions you should ask or areas you should explore to make sure the needs of each team are met when evaluating a vendor. So first for engineering or technical teams, how easy is it to integrate with other systems, whether that's your CRM, your live agent console, your order management system, really any external source you may want your assistant to communicate and leverage. Related, do they make it easy to bring the data and resources your assistant is gonna need into the platform and management? So uh, like Nora called out, syncing your data, transforming your data, that's gonna be the knowledge content and other data sets, so think product catalogs, PDFs, that are gonna make up the bulk of your assistant's knowledge. As Nora also mentioned, your data doesn't have to be perfect if you choose a vendor with tooling in place to help you manage and transform it as necessary. And then lastly, is it easy to write functions and code the assistant can leverage to further extend that platform functionality? And then for conversational architects and designers, is there a no-code editor that enables the team to leverage large language models at any point in the build process? So not just for generating answers from knowledge base, but for helping classify the conversation, provide feedback, help route the conversation effectively, and much more. This is gonna help ensure you've got the flexibility to both build what you want and avoid the sort of hallucinations that Natalie was highlighting. And then is there support for a range of LLMs as well as the ability to eventually bring your own model if desired. So you're not with, stuck with a limited or outdated set of options that don't match your, your use case. And then is there the requisite level of tooling needed to actually debug a conversation and get the required testing in place? Can you trace all the way down to an individual prompt level, examine a prompt chain and identify exactly what happened and why for a particular user utterance, and then build testing around it to ensure you don't have regressions before publishing or making changes to your assistant. And then for business and CX leaders, is there the requisite analytics tooling required to understand performance and glean insight? This means good out of the box reporting with the ability to build custom reports to track the metrics that matter most to your business. We know from experience that generally a one size fits all dashboard isn't gonna cut it. And then is there a channel ecosystem to make sure you can actually meet your customers where they are, deploying the same assistant across channels like voice, web chat, Apple messages for business and more to quickly realize time to value and not duplicate work when you're launching a new channel. 
And then lastly, how seamlessly does the experience fit into your overall workflow? Whether that means getting conversational data or info into your CRM, getting data via CSV or webhook, integrating into your existing agent workflow so you're not creating a disjointed experience for your agents, for your customers, and more. When picking the right vendor, it's important to make sure they speak to all parts of the business that are gonna be involved in building out great conversational AI experiences. The above are a few features and functionality you should consider when choosing a vendor and will help ensure you don't get trapped in that false build versus buy dilemma. When you evaluate your vendor correctly, you can have the best of both build and buy. Uh, so thank you for attending this webinar, everyone. And thank you, Nora and Natalie, for providing such great real world insight as practitioners working to build generative AI experiences every day with our customers. Um, we've got time for a couple questions here. Um, so please send those in if you haven't already. We'll answer a few of those. And if you don't get your question answered, we'll be happy to follow up afterwards. And um, we will also be sharing a recording of this webinar as well. Okay, so we've got a question on, is it possible to connect your AI assistant with other tools besides your knowledge base? So yeah, the answer is definitely yes, whether that's uh, an order management system, a product catalog, that can all be leveraged within an assistant as well and can follow that same process that both Nora and Natalie highlighted in terms of trans transforming that information and then building out a flow around it to ensure you're preventing hallucinations. Um, so data outside of just your knowledge base can certainly be, certainly be leveraged within a assistant. And then we've got uh, a question on, is it possible to switch LLMs? Um, so yeah, it's certainly possible. And Natalie, feel free to jump in here with a bit more detail, but the general best practice we'll use when building out as assistant is there'll be uh, a default model a default model we may be using for an assistant, um, but our conversational design team will often use a different model or a different LLM for a particular prompt, and then can also upgrade those over time as well. Does having well-organized and accurate knowledge help minimize the chance of assistants hallucinating? Um, so I think as, as Nora kind of highlighted, uh, there's a lot of work that the right vendor can do to kind of help transform your data. But at the end of the day, the assistant is only going to be as good as the data it has access to. So if there are lots of conflicting articles in your data set or uh, a lot of missing information, those things can certainly increase the likelihood um, that your assistant's going to give a less than ideal answer. As Natalie highlighted, there's lots of steps we can take to ensure that if it doesn't have enough evidence or the answer it's trying to send isn't corroborated by the articles it has access to, it won't send those answers, but certainly the more accurate information you have, uh, the better when building out an assistant. Okay, great. Well, once again, thank you everyone. If you'd like to learn more, please visit quick.com where you can read real world case studies from our customers who are already seeing great results with generative AI experiences in the market, learn more about our offering or schedule a call uh, if you'd like to learn more.